The book of Hebrews, the first chapter, is where we are this morning. If you would join with me, please, in turning there. Hebrews chapter 1. We return again this morning to the first four verses of this first chapter, Hebrews chapter 1, and we read beginning at verse 1 down to verse 4. The Word of God says this, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's go to our God together in prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, we have come in here this morning, a a group of needy people. That is true unanimously. That is true with each and every person sitting here right now. We are in great need whether we are aware of it or whether we are not. Some have come here this morning with warm hearts, ready to receive the Word of God. Some sit here right now with cold hearts, some longing that their hearts would not be cold, but having to acknowledge that they are. Some sit here, your children, some sit here having not yet met your son, still belonging to the domain of darkness, not yet having been transferred to the kingdom of your dear Son. Lord, who is adequate for these things? We are not. But we are grateful that your word is sufficient. We are grateful that your spirit is present. We are grateful that you are here, that your Son walks in the midst of this church, and that everything that is needed for this hour is found in him. So, Lord, meet with us around your word, feed your sheep, and may the lost today hear the voice of your Son, calling to them through the proclamation of himself. And may we today have the joy of seeing sinners trust in Jesus for life. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For the past two Sundays, I have told you that in the Opening paragraph of the book of Hebrews, you have a sevenfold description of the glorious Son of God. Each and every one of these seven descriptions is wonderful. Each and every one is key. Each and every one is precious. But now, this morning, we have come to what is the heart of these descriptions. Uh, it's, it's long been recognized that there is a chiastic organization to this opening paragraph. If you can envision it in your mind, if you think of two tables of descriptions, two tables of descriptions, side by side, and if you start from the outer edges of these two tables of descriptions and you move step by step toward the center, we have come this morning to the center of these two tables of description. On the outside edges is the truth that Jesus is better than any other messenger of God. In verse 1 and verse 2, we are told, think of these two tables, we're told on the one side that Jesus is better than the prophets. God has spoken to the world in many ways, in many portions. He spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son. Move to the other table of description and you have at the end of it the fact that Jesus has a name superior to angels. 
God has throughout history at times. He has mediated His, His Word to the world through prophets. He has mediated His Word to the world through angels. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. Take a step inside those two truths. And we're told that Jesus is the Father's appointed heir of all things. On the one hand, He is the heir of all things. On the other hand, we are told He has now sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In both cases, His exalted position is what is set before us. He is the owner of all things. He is the ruler of all things. He's the possessor of all things. He's the heir of all things. He has finished everything given to Him to finish in terms of the work of redemption. Having sat down, He is now exalted in the heavens. So His exalted position is set before us in both of those statements. Take a step inside those two truths. And what are we told? We are told on the one hand that Jesus is the one through whom the Father brought into being everything that has been created. Jesus is the creator of the universe. In the other description we are told that by His Word all things presently exist. He is the sustainer of the entire universe. The Word of His power is that which sustains all things right now. Both statements have to do with Jesus as Creator and sustainer Jesus in terms of His relationship to the creation, to the physical creation, to the universe. So we see Him as messenger, we see Him as ruler, we see Him as creator, and now we come to these two statements in the center that both magnify the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was and is God. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. These two statements are synonymous. They mean the same thing, just different words. And both proclaim the truth that Jesus was and is, has always been, in terms of His divine nature, God. And it's this truth that really explains the others. It's what is at the center of this description that really explains all of the other statements and makes them make sense. I mean, how do you explain Jesus as the preeminent way in which God has spoken to mankind, even greater than the angels? How do you explain Jesus as the head of all things, that all things are under His feet, that He rules over all things? How do you explain that Jesus created all things and now sustains all things? There's only one explanation for that. The one who is preeminent messenger, the one who is sovereign ruler, the one who is powerful creator is himself divine. He is God. What we see this morning is something that is unique. What we find in these two statements does not focus on the function of the Son of God. It focuses on Christ's very nature. We're not told what He does. We're told who He is. And it's because of who He is that the Father could do through Him what the Father did. It's because of who He is that Jesus could do what Jesus did. We're reminded in these two statements that when the world saw Jesus of Nazareth, they were seeing the Father. Because the Father's nature is the Son's nature. The world was meeting with the second person of the Trinity, with the eternal Son of God, who had become man. So that these two statements not only speak of an amazing person, they speak of an amazing passion. They speak not only of eternal realities, but of an amazing, condescending, gracious choice that was made manifest in time, something that actually took place in history, in time, when the eternal Son of God came to earth, took to Himself a sinless human nature so that God was with us. What is said of Jesus in these two statements, we would not even know to be true if not for the Incarnation. What is said of Him here has always been true of Him, but we would not have known it to be true of Him without the Incarnation. And the Incarnation was for the purpose of our redemption. 
So if we were to take both statements together, there are two points. Number one, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Number two, Jesus is the representation of God's being. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus is the representation of God's being. Two ways of expressing the same thought. But as I said this morning, we're just going to focus on the first one. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God. Let's just get the most basic observation out of the way right away when it comes to both of these statements. Away with the thought that Jesus is not God. Away with the thought that Jesus is not God, that somehow Jesus himself, the Son of God, was, was some sort of creation of God, some sort of a lesser God, some, you know, some sort of, of one who, through whom God did certain things, but, but he was not equal with the Father. Away with that thought. It's a demonic lie. What we read here could never be said of any mere mortal To say that He is the radiance of God, to say that He is the exact representation of God's nature, that couldn't be said of you, couldn't be said of me, couldn't be said of any other mere human being. These words could not be said of any prophet or apostle or king or priest or angel. These are astounding words that transcend what is appropriate for anyone except someone who is equal with God. You could not say this of Adam even before the fall. You could not say this of Abraham or Moses. You could not say this of David or someone like Jeremiah or Isaiah or John the Baptist even. You could not say this of the angels Gabriel or Michael. What is said here is beyond the capacity of any created being. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Commentator R.T. France had this to say. He said the double clause that opens verse 3 describes the Son's relation to God more directly and even more unequivocally, not now in His creative role but in His essential nature. He is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of His being. He is, in other words, as in John 1, 14 and 18, God made visible. To see what God is like, we must look at the Son. And to that we say amen. Two things I want to point out about this particular statement that we're looking at this morning, I want you to see that Jesus is the eternal radiance of God, and I want you to see that He's the glorious radiance of God. First of all, the eternal radiance of God. In the ESV, it says in verse 3, He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is. Translates a relative pronoun and a present tense participle. Hos own. Those are the words in the Greek text, hos on, who, literally, who being, who being. That relative pronoun looks back to the word son in verse 2, in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. Then verse 3, who being, this son, the son is the subject, being the radiance of the glory of God. That present participle in verse 3 contrasts with an aorist participle in verse 4 where it says, having become as much superior to angels, having become. The writer is telling us that Jesus became as much superior to, to the angels as the name he inherited is greater than theirs. That has reference to the incarnation 
to the finished work of redemption, resurrection, ascension, being set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This work of redemption was accomplished in time and history so that the God-man became, came to be in this exalted position that the Father has given Him. He became this, but what is spoken of here in our statement has reference to something timeless. This is not what Jesus became. This is making reference to what He is by virtue of His eternal nature as the eternal Son of God. He did not become this. He is this because of who He is from all eternity. A.T. Robertson commenting on that first participle in verse 3 said this, being, own, absolute and timeless existence. Present active participle of me, which means to be, in contrast with gnomenos in verse 4. Who being the radiance of the glory of God. When was he, when was he this? Well, from all eternity. You have the same kind of contrast in John, the first chapter, when you read the first verse and then you contrast it with verse 14. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When was the Word? When was the Word with God? When was the Word God? The answer, from all eternity. Never a time when He wasn't. And then verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So you have the eternal Word, Christ, who was with God and was God, becoming flesh in time, in history, so that His glory as the unique Son of God would be seen, God made visible. You have the same contrast in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 6 reads this way, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Who though he was in the form of God, that is literally, if you were to translate that in a wooden fashion, who in form of God being, who in form of God being, Hos in morphe theu hu parkon, who in form of God being. Being is a, is a present active participle. You get to Philippians 2, 7, and it says this, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. That is gnomenos. Same word that's in our text. There it is an aorist participle. He always was in the form of God, being in the form of God, but He became, he came to be in the likeness of men. Already existing in the form of God from all eternity, came to be in the likeness of men in time, in history. And so in our verse when it says He is the radiance of the glory of God, if you ask when did he become this? The answer is he never became this. He has always been this. He has always been this. This has to do with his eternal nature. This has to do with his eternal being. So the eternal radiance of Almighty God, of the glorious God, of the glory of God, which gets to the second thought this morning, the glorious radiance of God. What has He been from all eternity? He has been the radiance of the glory of God. The Father's glory. The radiance of the Father's glory because He possesses the same nature as the Father. God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Each person of the trinity possessing the one divine nature. The writer uses a word here that's only used here in the New Testament. Only time you find this particular word translated radiance. Apagasma is the word. Uh, the Greek lexicon commonly referred to as bdag has this to say about this particular word. In the active sense, it means radiance, effulgence. 
in the sense of brightness from a source. In the passive sense, it could mean reflection, brightness shining back. And then there's this note, the meaning cannot always be determined with certainty. So the word can mean in an active sense that that Jesus is a light source. There is light radiating from the Son of God. Or it can mean in a passive sense that He would be reflecting light. In, In both cases, it would speak of brilliant light, resplendent light, but it would, e- it would either be like the sun shining its rays or like the moon reflecting the light of the sun. And throughout the history of, of the interpretation of this passage, there have been some who have taken each position. John Calvin, for exam- example, took the position this was reflection. But the early church fathers unanimously understood this in the active sense, that Jesus is himself the source of light in this case. And I think think what you're trying to determine is whether this is a statement about his eternal nature or more of a statement about what his humanity would have reflected. Kent Hughes captures my thinking about it when he says this, the translation radiance here is proper as against some others which use reflection. There's a vast difference between the two, as different as the functions of our solar system's sun and moon. The moon reflects light, whereas the sun radiates light because it is its source. And then he says this, Jesus does not simply reflect God's glory, he is part of it. This was shown on the Mount of Transfiguration when his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them, Mark 9 verse 3. It was His own essential glory, but it was also the Father's. This is what blinded Paul on the Damascus road. This is why the Nicene Creed sings of Christ, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. So that Jesus could be, before the eyes of men, what He was, because of who he has always been. If you saw him, you saw the Father, because this is the eternal Son who has now come to earth and become man. What is he the radiance of? He's the radiance of the glory of God. The glory of God in this context is the sum total of all of God's attributes. The glory of God is the nature of God. The glory of God is the character of God. The glory of God is who God is. The glory of God is His name. The glory of God is His being. I said to you a moment ago, and I still think this to be right, these two statements are synonymous. And so if you look at the second one, He's the exact imprint of His nature. The exact imprint of His nature. So He is the radiance of God's glory, which is to say God's nature. In Jesus of Nazareth, we had God incarnate. God now become man so that he became man, but never ceased to be eternal God, never ceased to be one with the Father, never ceased to be the second person of the Trinity. What men saw in Jesus was the light of God because he is God. And the Jewish carpenter men met with God in human flesh. The light of Jesus was not physical light, other than for a brief moment of the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory, the the manifest glory of God was veiled. It wasn't physical light that men beheld in Jesus, it was the light of God's character, the light of God's nature, the light of who God really is. Manifest in this man, the God-man, so that God's nature and character and being was put on display right there in the presence of other men in this one. Commentator Richard Phillips said this, Hot and brilliant as the sun is in the heavens, we would never see it 
or feel its warmth without the radiating beams that come to the earth. So it is with God and His Son, who is the radiance of His glory. Without the Son, we remain in the dark regarding the glory of God. But with the Son, we have an ideal, indeed a perfect revelation of God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, that we see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he said this, and I so appreciated this. He said, we do not see God in Christ through drawings that purport to represent His features, much less through an actor who tries to represent the way Jesus must have been. We see God in Christ through the Bible's teachings of His person and work, of His holy zeal and compassionate love, of His heavenly words and mighty saving works. As Martin Lloyd-Jones explains, a servant may be able to say everything that is right about his Lord and Master. He may know Him well and intimately, but he can never represent Him in the way that the Son can. The Son is a manifestation of the Father by being what He is. Thus, our Lord Himself, while here on earth, represented and manifested the name of God in a way that is incomparable and greater than all others because He is the Son of God. Jesus, not a prophet who said, look at me and learn something about God, not an an angel who would say, listen to me and learn something about God, but the Son of God who was able to say, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. This is what Jesus said about Himself. This is exactly the kind of imagery that He chose to use when speaking about Himself. He was God's light to the world. John chapter 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from. And where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judges, but I and the Father who sent me. What claims these are? You don't know where I came from. Where did you come from, Jesus? He came from heaven. Who sent you, Jesus? The Father sent me. Whose judgment, Jesus, do you represent? The Father's judgment. I and the Father, you see, are one. You hear my judgment, you hear the Father's judgment. John chapter 9, verse 4, he said, We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Not one of many lights, the light. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Dear ones, is that some small claim? Could anyone here this morning say, I am the light of the world? When prophecies were given concerning John the Baptist, we find these in the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, the 76th verse, it says this, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways. Whose ways will you prepare? John, you'll prepare the Lord's ways. To give knowledge of salvation to His people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. The sunrise will visit us from on high. This 
is the light of the world. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. Hallelujah. Amen? Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, the one and only Son of God, the unique Son of God, the eternal Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The light of the world, the radiance, the effulgence, the shining forth of God's glory. Came into the world. And the only way to be saved is to believe in Him. And the, and the only way you come to Him is when Almighty God changes your heart because you see, the hearts of people are evil, wicked. We, by nature, since the fall, are human beings who love darkness, not light. So the only way to ever come to the light is Almighty God has mercy upon a soul and opens the heart and shines His light in so that now they can see, we could see in the case of all of us who have been saved, the glory of God stationed in the face of Jesus Christ. We saw Jesus and recognized Him for who He really is, God in human flesh, the, the eternal Son of God come to earth to save sinners by giving His life as a sacrifice, as a substitute on a cross to pay for all the sins of all those who will trust in Him. That is what Jesus came to be. That is what Jesus came to do. The radiance of the glory of God. We'll deal with the next statement next time, but let me finish this morning by asking how do we respond to such a statement? How do we respond to such a statement? What do we do with it? And I can probably give these same five points next time because they're going to be just as applicable. But let me just give them this morning and I may repeat them next time. Let me give you five ways we respond to this. First of all, we worship Jesus. We worship Him. We worship the God who is Trinity. We worship the Father. We worship the Son. We worship the Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are God. Our view of God is monotheistic, but it's not modalistic. There's one God who's eternally existed in three persons. It's not one God who has a father face, a son face, and a spirit face. No, one God who's eternally existed in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So the Father we recognize as God, the Son we recognize as God, the Spirit we recognize as God, three in one we worship the Trinity. And so we worship the Son even as we worship the Father and the Spirit. Have you ever said, along with Thomas, when looking at Jesus, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God? John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. No one has ever seen God, but you see, the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made God known. 
who is Jesus, God in human flesh. Have you ever worshipped Jesus as God? Have you ever worshipped Him as your Savior, as your Lord? I've mentioned it, but let me read it, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge. This is light in the form of knowledge. To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. That's the confession of every person who is truly a child of God. Jesus is is Lord. Second, we not only worship Jesus, we are thankful for Jesus. How do we respond to this? We are thankful for Jesus. He is the Father's indescribable gift. What amazing love, what amazing mercy, what amazing grace that the Father would give to this world of sinful human beings, His only Son, His one and only Son. What amazing grace, love, and mercy that the, that the Son would voluntarily step out of heaven and come to this earth to save sinners. We are thankful. We are thankful that Jesus came to earth. We are thankful that He lived a sinless life. We are thankful that He died on the cross for us. We are thankful that He was raised from the dead. We are thankful that He has made God known to us. He has revealed God to us. We are thankful that He has accomplished our redemption. Is your heart this morning full of thanks for Jesus? Do you worship Him? Do you give God thanks for your Savior? Third, how do we respond to this? We behold God in Jesus. We behold God in Jesus. That is, do you want to know who God is? Understand what God has done for us in His Son. Take all of the statements made about God throughout the Scriptures in an abstract sense, in, 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 in just, in just the, the form of statements, and then realize that in Jesus you have them all in concrete. You hear God tell us that He's a God of mercy. Now, do you want to see God's mercy? Look at Jesus. You hear God say He's a God of love. Do you want to see the love of God? Look at Jesus. Do you want to see the forgiveness of God? Look at Jesus. Do you want to see the long-suffering of God? Look at Jesus. Do you want to see the patience of God? Look at Jesus. Do you want to see the justice of God? Listen to Jesus. Look at Jesus. In Jesus we behold God. This is how God has chosen to set Himself before us. In the preeminent way, it is in His Son. And it is so instructive how God did this. He did not do this by giving us some description of the appearance of Jesus. This is what sinful man wants to do. We always want to paint his picture. We always want, we want to make a movie and have everybody see him. And yet, isn't it instructive that when God set his glory before us in the person of his son, he did not do it with a description of his physical appearance, but a description of his character and nature and being and words and deeds. That's where you'll see God. Look at Jesus and listen to him and watch him and behold him. That's how you'll know who God is really is. And then all of those other statements about God are, are living and vibrant in a way that has increased because we see Jesus. So we worship Jesus. We're thankful for Jesus. We behold God in Jesus. Fourth, we anticipate Jesus. Have you ever seen Him? Church, have you ever seen Him other than with the eyes of faith? Have you seen Jesus physically? What's the answer? I hope you say no. You say yes, and we have another problem. No, we haven't seen him, but, but the Bible tells us, whom having not seen, we love. Whom having not seen, we love. We love him. We've seen him with the eyes of faith. We've seen him described in the pages of Scripture. We've come to faith in him. We've seen him in that sense. We love him right now. But, but listen, one day we're going to see him face to face. One day we're going to see him face to face. And when we see him, we will be made like him. Then what we know now, in all of his fullness, yet not fully experienced, right? We long for the day that, that sin no longer has an abiding place in us. We long for the day when we have a resurrected body, a new body that matches the new us. 
We look for the consummation, the final consummation of the salvation that is already ours in Christ. When we see Jesus, we'll be conformed to His image. We look forward to that day, don't we? We anticipate the day that we will see Jesus. So we worship Him. We are thankful for Him. We behold God in Him. We anticipate Him. Fifth, until that day, we strive for likeness to Jesus. We understand what this work of progressive sanctification is. It is conformity to the image of Jesus. And and what kind of conformity is it? This is so instructive. Listen, this, this this will, if we take this into our hearts, it will save us from much hypocrisy. The conformity to the image of Christ is a conformity of character. It's not something we put on. It's not a certain kind of smile. It's not a certain kind of manner. It's not a certain lilt in our voice when we say certain words. It is when the love of God finds expression in our love. The forgiveness of Christ finds expression in our forgiveness. The patience of Christ finds expression in our patience. The mercy of Christ in our mercy The steadfastness of Christ and our steadfastness as we are conformed to the image of Christ in terms of character, the fruit of the Spirit, now likeness to Jesus is taken on in an increasing way. That's called maturity. That's called maturity in the Christian life. And until the day that we see our Savior face to face, we strive together with the work of the Spirit and the work of God's Word in our lives toward that end, toward that aim. And we know it's imperfect, and we know it falls far, far short of the goal in an infant, by an infinite measure every day, yet we continue to strive for that kind of conformity because that glorifies God. And that, listen, that makes us powerful witnesses in this world. We know it's, too, it's not in the same way. We know it's, it's, it's an imperfect way, but isn't it instructive That that Jesus, who was the light of the world, says to his people that now we are lights in this world. We are lights in this world. John 8, 12, again, therefore Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. God has given us the life of his son. And now because there's the presence of life, there is that light that belongs to that life. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. God made himself known to this world in a perfect way, in the light of the world, in the eternal Son of God come to earth, the God-man, and now, listen, now God is making himself known to the world through his Son, but in a way that's unimaginable in in his body, the church, through the members who have been joined to him. It's imperfect, but this is how God is making himself known to the world right now, through his son, that is, the body of his son, the members of his son, the children of God who are living on this earth. We are lights in this world. And I just wonder... I just wonder, the way, you, child of God, the way you have been living, how much of Jesus is this world really seeing? How much is he seeing? You know, I have both the joy and the sorrow of doing a lot of counseling with, with, with God's people, and, I, and I, I believe the consistent thing that is often missing from our perspective is that we have a higher purpose than this one little snippet of our life. This issue, that issue, this thing we're dealing with, that thing we're dealing with, lift up your eyes and ask, are you manifesting the life of the Son of God in the way you're responding to that situation? Is that how Jesus would look? Is that how he would sound? Is that how he would have felt about it? Is that how he would have dealt with it? Are you striving together with the Lord, saying, Oh, Lord, produce in my life, in all of my circumstances and situations, the life and light of your Son, so that this world might see Jesus in and through me. Imperfectly, yes, but really. May the world see Jesus through me. Who is Jesus? He is 
the radiance of the glory of God. And we worship Him. Don't we, church? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious Son. Thank you for your indescribable gift. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room who does not know Jesus, may they this morning long for your Son. May they see their spiritual bankruptcy. May they see their emptiness. May they recognize they will never be forgiven of their sins and never be made whole apart from Jesus. May they put their faith in Christ. May they, though they have not seen Him with the physical eyes, may they see Him with the eyes of faith this morning and may they love Him. And I pray for us, Your people, O Lord, where we have been short-sighted near to blindness, where we have lost touch with our everlasting purpose, where we are dealing with situations in a way that neglects and forgets that we are lights in this world, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be broken and we would lift our eyes up and we would long for and strive for conformity to your Son in our thinking, in our words, and in our deeds, in our character. Oh, Lord, make us more like Jesus. We love you in his name. We give you praise in his name. We offer this as worship to you in his wonderful name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.